1. Short explanation of the environment. Early 1990s, when I was working at IBM's tech support for their AS400 series, a mid-range server system, multi-user, and can have anywhere from 2 to well over 200 hard drives and terabytes of data. Large for the 90s. A few terms may be needed to help the story. IPL, Initial Program Load, is basically either powering up or a reboot. Retain, IBM's master worldwide system of problem and incident recording, notes, etc., with records entered by each tech as they work with the clients, all their companies, not individuals. IBM runs three shifts in tech support daily. I worked late second and early third shift. Notification came in on retain. This was about 8.30 p.m. on a Wednesday. I'm in the middle of second shift, and it seemed to be a fairly normal call. Usually, if it's a program, recompile it or restore it from a backup. If it's part of the operating system, fixing stuff like this requires either tweaking the actual objects by a developer signed on remotely, or reinstalling part of the operating system, partially or fully. When the call came in, I noticed that the problem record had originated in Retain a little bit after noon today. There were about ten recurrences of this customer coming in all afternoon on this same problem record. All were in regards to damaged or missing objects. Why so many? Each technician before me had handled each individual issue, either restoring, recompiling, or tweaking objects. But I noticed something at the very top entry, the first call in the record. Damaged object found at IPL. Wait. This record originated around noon, and it was an error occurring during an IPL. A rebooter powering up the system. What is a business or any organization doing a reboot at high noon on a typical business day? Usually, a company will have their systems down for maintenance and or backups, like at night or on the weekend or both. So this seemed quite odd to me. Even more odd and coincidental, they had many calls this afternoon. I brought over my manager and had him on the phone with the client, and I sheepishly asked the client, What was going on at the time you were IPLing the system? And there's a long, awkward pause. We had a disk crash. In today's parlance, it was a facepalm event. If the first technician, or any of them after that, would have asked that basic question, what led to this, the proper answer would be a full restore of the system from backup. The restore process could take anywhere from 3 to 12 hours or more. But at the rate this client was going, he'd probably tie us up for the whole next week getting assistance, trying to piece together missing and damaged objects. We got them going on doing a partial restore of the system and ran a checking function for missing and damaged objects. At least I got a few attaboys for having the presence of mind to look at the forest, not the individual trees. 2. This happened yesterday, but I'm still fuming just thinking about it. I got into a screaming contest with my boss because, as always, her ignorance was somehow my fault. So she got a colleague to email me this Excel spreadsheet that she wanted me to burn to a CD. Because burning a CD is an extremely complex task that should only be performed by rocket scientists with master's degrees in nuclear physics. Yeah, yeah. I know what some of you are thinking. Aren't CDs obsolete in 2021? Why, yes, yes, they are. But I work in a municipality... And where I'm from, almost all the public institutions, and some of the private ones, still use them. Anyway, I burn the damn CD and give it to my colleague, who later gives it to my boss. Later that day, I'm in the deputy mayor's office doing something else, when my boss comes to that office several times, for different reasons. So now she knows where I am. Just when my work there is done, and I open the door to leave, I see my boss, who is about to enter, holding the pieces of a broken CD in her hands. It's a good thing I check everything. How could you screw up this badly? Instead of the file you were supposed to, you burn Mayor Randall Winston's declaration of property. A little backstory. Since we work in the public sector, recently we had to fill out a declaration where we declare, duh, all the properties, houses, apartments, cars, etc. that we own. We do this once every year. So since we are a municipality, we have a bunch of small towns surrounding our city. Their town halls are kind of like our subsidiaries. 
So the files she was referring to were two files that were the declaration of the mayor of one of these towns. Back to the screaming contest. I know what I burned, you think I'm blind? Those files aren't anywhere near the same folder as the one I burned this morning. Don't lie to me, I saw them with my own eyes. I broke the CD because it's useless now. Those files weren't on the CD. Come with me to your office and I'll show you. If you hadn't broken the CD, I could also show you the real file on it. We go into her office, while screaming at the top of her lungs on the way there. Why are you still here? Go to your office and burn another CD with the right file this time. I'm here because you're accusing me of something I didn't do. Go on, open your optical device, see. The CD is out, yet those files are still there. And look what it says above them. Files ready to be written to the disk. So, what does that mean? Exactly what it says. Those files are ready to be written to a disk, but they're not written. They are on your computer, not the disk. And where is the crack file, then? You broke the CD, so I can't show you. We exchange some more pleasantries, and I go to my office to burn her another CD. I bring it to her, and I stay in the room to see her opening it with my own eyes. She puts the CD in, and immediately goes to the optical device while the disc is still spinning. The two files from the declaration are still there. Delete these files already. How? Like any other file, I told you, they are not on the CD, they are on your computer. She deletes the files. However, not only is Windows Explorer not showing the file I just burned to the CD, but it actually ejects the tray with the disk. She takes it out, and just as she's about to mouth off to me again, I notice she's holding it kind of strange. Wait a minute. Is that the way you put it in the tray? Yeah. Flip it over? The label should be on the outside, while the shiny side should be on the inside. Her case is small, so the optical drive is installed vertically, rather than horizontally. She does as I say. Then she puts the CD back in, and lo and behold, the file is there in all its glory. Does that mean I've been putting the other CD in the wrong way too? And that's why I didn't see the file? <sighs> Probably. I didn't get anything resembling an apology, let alone an actual apology. She just awkwardly laughed a few times afterwards in an attempt to make me laugh with her. But I was way too pissed for that. And another thing that boggles the mind is the colleague who sent me the file, then came to my office and was watching me burn it. So according to my boss's logic, we both somehow missed the fact that instead of burning the one correct file to a CD, I mistakenly burned two incorrect ones. Three. So my story starts back in mid-1990-something, and I'm currently working for one of the top tech service companies worldwide. My team takes on new contracts, companies that realize it's better to outsource their IT rather than working in-house. So I'm in a strange situation of working with local IT, learn what they know about their company's idiosyncrasies, work out who we want to keep or lose, and pass those recommendations to my boss and tech tips to our multi-company help desk. One morning, we get a call from the help desk about a user who is constantly having problems with her machine, and help desk is requesting a PC change. The ticket itself goes back for months with other tickets linked to it, Users' files become corrupt, which, as they were on new servers, were backed up each time they were changed, so restorers solved those. Then the user software starts playing up, both MS and Bespoke, which was resolved by the help desk by either sending reinstalls over the network or remote onto the PC to manually install the software. Now, the machine won't put it all. Non-system on the hard disk drive. Hence the swap-out request. Swap-out was easy because all the machines were generic with profiles downloaded from the tube for first-time use, so we took the problem PC and gave her a new one. We checked the machine, and the OS was corrupted. Complete reinstall, some health checks, and the machine was back in circulation. After a couple of weeks, the same ticket is back. Exact same issue. Files become corrupt. Then apps start not working. Again, we take her PC away and now thinking it might be something in her profile. So we dump her profile and replace it with a generic one. New PC and she's up and running. 
Her faulty PC is working okay. OS was working, but MS Office wouldn't load, so we did a complete rebuild of that and again returned it back to the pool. Couple of weeks later, and you guessed it, happens again. This time, the HD agent calls my work mobile to let me know, as my prints are all over the last tickets. I happened to be on the floor below the user at the time, so I let the agent know to call her back, as I'll pop over to her desk now. I enter the lift, exit at the next floor, turn around to the open office area, and watch in disbelief as the user is dutifully removing hundreds of fridge magnets off her PC. Turns out she collects fridge magnets from around the world. Her family and friends would bring her loads wherever they go. She ran out of space on her fridge freezer at home, and recently realized the metal box under her CRT could hold her hobbies, so she brought a few in and her work colleagues added more and more to her collection, which coated her PC into a magnetic haven and, I guess, erasing ones and zeros from her memory chips and HDD. After spraying the user with water, no, no, wrong, bad kitty, we never had these problems back again. Little tidbit. While I was working there, I was with one of their in-house techs in the middle of a temp pool going over some of their work when the entire network went down. We hear temps nearby start moaning that everything stopped working. Another mentions, Hey, didn't I see some of the techs around here? And everyone starts looking around for us. At this point, the tech I'm with ducks down under the desk, leaving me like a deer in the headlights with about 50 women staring at me. 4. This happened a few years ago when I was working as a middle manager at a small factory. Having previously worked in tech support, I was a go-to guy for everything IT related. You know how it goes. We were using this old ERM and process planning software that were most recently updated in 1991, which we accessed through some custom purpose-built terminal emulator applications on Windows. Picture light grey and blue in the classic IBM 3270 font. Not all my colleagues would agree, but it was actually pretty nice working almost exclusively using the keyboard, and the only thing holding you back were how fast you could fly through the different keybinds. When you worked there for a while, you developed this intimate relationship with the software, and the screens were just flickering with the speed at which you were doing things. It was especially a challenge training new people as everything was just muscle memory by that point, and slowing down enough to make it possible to see what's going on was surprisingly grueling work. My point is, any slight delay in the response of the application stood out like a slap in the face. That's why this bug was so annoying. Sometimes, for some more than others, a two to four second delay would occur. The whole application would freeze, all key presses queued up for them to be executed in the same timing as they were entered a few seconds later. This time warp effect would linger for a long time, basically having you see the screen two to four seconds in the past, or typing two to four seconds into the future, depending on your perspective. This sucked. What made it weird was how this also happened to the mouse, but OS-wide, unlike the keyboard delay, effectively ruling out network issues, which had been extensively tested and investigated. This was really interesting, so I told people to tell me whenever they had this problem, to just let go of the mouse and keyboard and come get me. The recommended solution was to just restart the application after finishing whatever lengthy process you were in the middle of, and it would usually go away. Usually, which was intriguing. If it didn't work, you disconnected and reconnected any monitors, changed the mouse or keyboard, going from HDMI, DVI, VGA, and back, connect or disconnect from docking station, and any one of those could randomly solve the problem. It was not performance related either, and the range software was extremely limited with any discrepancies easy to single out. Out of any clues or consistent behavior apart from the stuff above, and to rule out any weird local electrical issue or something, I contacted other branches and asked if they also had that issue. They had. Perhaps to a less extent than us, but it was definitely a frequent annoyance they just lived with, for as long as they could remember. This made me lose hope and I gave up looking. 
until one faithful day. I was talking on the phone and just clicking stuff absentmindedly, and the mouse suddenly started lagging behind. This had never happened before. It was always while you were actively using the terminal emulator typing. I realized I had moved the application window a tiny bit so that the window border was visible by a few pixels on the second monitor. Moving the window back to only be visible on the first monitor, and the delay was gone. Eureka! Turns out, the input handling part of the application would panic if less than a column of symbols from the terminal emulator was visible on a second monitor, or outside the area of a single desktop. If you went over one column of symbols, the delay would disappear. The reason our fixes from above worked came from windows often moving a little when resolution or desktop layout changes, and when Explorer switches graphical mode for a split second. It also came from the instinct to move windows around, or draw rectangles on the desktop when you reconnect a mouse to see if it's working. This application was always in window mode, so it was always at risk of being moved. We never got to know the details of the bug, as this was barely being maintained and soon to be phased out, which sucks. I suspect it had something to do with the symbols of the status bar of the application, and this bug only initiated while on subscreens and not in the root menu, but that's just guessing. No way to know. 5. I was in college, doing internships when classes weren't happening because money. This is a day and age where interns still got paid decently, and undergrads weren't considered less valuable than burger flippers. The previous internship I'd done was with the same company, but in the customer support division. So little old ladies and so, so many confused boomers would call in asking for help. I didn't mind the work, but having to brief people on where the start menu was in Windows XP and 7 got tedious after the 100th time explaining it's in the bottom left corner, not the bottom right. Started this next round super excited to work in corporate support. I thought I'd be working with my people, and it would be more technical and challenging. Unless, oh my god, can you put someone with a brain on the phone, please? Suffice to say, I was so very, very wrong. The company I worked for made and supported an antivirus. And no, I'm not telling which one. When someone called in, they were identified immediately, and the number of licenses they had for the product came up on the screen. This is important because it helps gauge the actual severity of an issue. Everyone who had at least one license got helped, make no mistake. Sadly, though, numbers matter, and someone with 2,000 or 10,000 clients with a mild issue would get escalated over someone with 10 who had a complete work stoppage because the antivirus got twitchy. All of this is background for the call. I answered the phone, and this guy who made sure I actually added his job title and super important certifications to his contact information, network administrator in CCNA for those curious, this officious windbag then informs me he is calling because his databases won't update on any of his clients. This is a very common problem to have. If someone forgets to feed an internet hamster somewhere and a packet gets lost, the checksum won't match, and the whole database gets flagged as invalid and starts throwing a tantrum. This solution takes all of 30 seconds. Pause the antivirus, which doesn't work without a signature database anyway. Go to a folder in the updated directory, delete the database files, re-enable the antivirus and update. Job done. I tell the network administrator, CCNA, that this is a quick fix you'll have to apply to each client before they'll update again, and I'll walk him through it once so he knows how to do it. He immediately exclaims in shock and dismay that he's not going to 150 computers and repeating this process. Remember the license information I had to get before I could help? Yeah. Homeboy had 12 licenses and only 8 were active. Also bear in mind that this process was not hard to do with GPO, or so many other things that could have made the process painless. But I think that would require Mr. Network Administrator, CCNA, to dislodge his head from his rectum. But oh wait, it gets dumber. I calmly explain that there is no other solution for this particular problem. Packets got dropped, and a bad database needs to be cleared before the software will actually work. He huffs and says fine. Whatever. 
Consumer style, I walk him through disabling the antivirus and then ask him to type percent update or percent into the address bar or the file browser and he says no. That's not a real location on his computer. And now he wants to speak to my supervisor because I'm clearly lying about where the files are located. At this point, my professorial reserve cracks and I blurt out, seriously. He then starts shouting about how serious he is and he'll have my job for this. He's a paying customer with 500 licenses. Notice that increase, did you? And he will not stand for being lied to in this manner. Enough's enough. I put him on hold and stood up to do the cubicle peek. My supervisor's cube was next to mine, and I was gobsmacked to discover that he'd actually been listening to my call. I was considered a problem child because of, possibly, valid reasons, unrelated, and thus got my premium digs. He's actually got his face buried in his hands, and doesn't look up when I ask if I should transfer the call. He just nods. I inform Mr. Network Administrator, CCNA, that he'll be transferred immediately and wish him a nice day. I go to the bathroom to splash water on my face and pinch myself to confirm this is real life and not a nightmare before sitting back down. And before I can take the next call and cue, my supervisor gets my attention and asks me to come with him. We both walk over to the head of support's office. Head of support usually had the temperament of a grizzly bear with a sore tooth and a bad case of dingleberries. I hadn't heard him actually angry before this fateful call. Mr. Network Administrator, CCNA, had worked himself up well into frothing rage at this point because he's been lied to three times by three different people about this nonsense app data folder. Now he's demanding a full refund of all 1,000 licenses he's purchased for the five years he's had them and won't be satisfied until all three lying support minions are fired and he gets that nice fat check. Head of support just had his fingers steepled and hasn't said anything since I've stepped into his office with my supervisor. I think he was just waiting for this clown shoe to wind down. Head of support gets his time to get a word in and uses it to fullest advantage. In an eerily calm voice, he asks Mr. Network Administrator, CCNA, if he's done and says good before the man can actually respond. He goes on to say that this call is concluded because Mr. Network Administrator CCNA lacks the common sense to put his pants on before his shoes. He then clearly states that an adult needs to call in to resolve this issue, and it had better not be Mr. Network Administrator CCNA, or the three-year license they had purchased a month ago will be invalidated because Mr. Network Administrator CCNA accidentally disconnected the internet while updates were running on all his clients and was too stupid to follow basic instructions to clean up his own mess. We actually heard him say, how did you, before they hang up. Wound up actually helping that company fix the problem a couple days later when a nice lady called in. My guess is she was the most tech-savvy admin they had. It took all of five minutes for her to get the issue resolved completely. When I asked about Mr. Network Administrator, CCNA, you could almost hear the eye roll. Apparently, the dude had precisely zero certifications and hadn't actually graduated from any college. He got hired for data entry and volunteered to do network administration stuff for a small pay bump after a ransomware virus locked that whole company down and they needed someone immediately. He was allowed to resign after the details about the call came to light. I think the compulsive lying might have had something to do with it. Still have no idea how Head of Support pulled that Jedi mind trick about accidentally disconnecting the internet. Kind of bothers me, but I never mustered up the courage to ask. Hey everybody, Hellfraser here, and thank you very much for listening to Terrific Tales of Technology, number 12. And thank you very much to everybody who allowed me to use their stories in this video. If you liked the video, then please do boop the like button and leave a comment, and share the video around with all your friends and family, and, uh, well, if you have any that are not very good with computers, you might have to start the video for them. Or you're just gonna kind of leave them, they'll figure it out eventually, it's fine, it's fine. Okay, we have a little birthday shout-out today. This birthday shout-out goes to Rose. Uh, I, I don't know how old Rose is, I, I won't even dare make a guess. 
Uh, I know Rose as Mrs. Hunter. Hunter is one of my moderators. Uh, they're married. Uh, that's why she's Mrs. Hunter. I don't think it says that in any legal document, so I'd be, I'd be surprised if it did. Anyway, I hope you have a very nice birthday today, Rose. I hope uh, the little one and your husband are behaving themselves and spoiling you for a change. All right, and before we go... Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Rose. Happy birthday to you. Ah, okay, I'm going to head off now because uh, I'm a little bit sleepy. And I have, I'm recording this quite early in the morning, and I have an appointment with a dermatologist later today. Uh, I think just filling paperwork and stuff out uh, to arrange the actual appointments for treatment. So I'm going to head off and sleep now. So until next time, thank you very much for listening, and take very good care of yourselves.